Any ads heard during this episode that are not in our voice are placed by third-party agencies. They should not be considered the opinion of or to be endorsed by Hoosier Miss and Legends. Welcome to another episode of the Hoosier Miss and Legends podcast. I'm Rebecca Wilhelm. I'm Mary Quigley. And I'm Hope Wilhelm. Join us as we dive into the spookier side of the Hoosier State. So what comes to your mind when you think of Indiana? Do you think of corn? Do you think of basketball? Do you think of the Indianapolis 500? Maybe you think of famous celebrities who were born in Indiana, like John Mellencamp or Michael Jackson. But as the saying goes, there is more than corn in Indiana. 92 counties make up the Hoosier State. In this podcast, we are going to discuss some Indiana folklore from each of these counties. If you are into tall tales, ghosts, or spooky legends, then this is a podcast you are not going to want to miss. The episode we have for you today comes from Indianapolis and concerns a former medical facility that had a 148-year-old history of treating the insane. In 1848, the Indiana Hospital for the Insane opened its doors on the west side of Indianapolis. The hospital treated patients who suffered from schizophrenia, dementia, depression, hysteria, alcoholism, and epilepsy. The hospital famously opened a pathology department in 1896 that's mission was to help research and treat these illnesses. In 1926, the hospital changed its name to the Indiana Central State Hospital. Records indicate that the hospital treated 2,500 patients in 1950. However, over the years, there were many stories circulating about patient abuse. In 1994, the hospital was closed due to concerns about patient care. Since before the hospital's closing and to this day, stories about spirits, voices from beyond, and other paranormal occurrences are a common occurrence on the grounds and in the old pathology building, which remains standing today. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and relax as we discuss Indiana's Hospital for the Insane. this haunted location in indiana really fascinates me oh i agree and i've not been to the medical museum yet but it's something i definitely want to do badly it's on my list to do as well the indiana medical history museum is located in the old pathology building yes and the pathology building is one of three original buildings that is left on the grounds today so let's go ahead and get into it as early as 1827, Indiana had been trying and had passed legislation on having a hospital for those suffering from a variety of mental illnesses. In November of 1848, this became a reality when Indiana's Hospital for the Insane opened its doors on the west side of Indianapolis. The hospital admitted five patients when it opened its doors. As we said in the opening of the show, the term mentally ill referred to a lot of different things back then. Everything from being depressed or melancholy, as it was referred to, to alcoholism was admitted to the hospital. The worst term that was often used to describe patients was the term simple, and this meant patients who may have just been a little bit slower than their peers. Patients who were considered criminally insane were also patients at the hospital. That seems terrifying to me. It really does. I mean, when you take into consideration that people were in the hospital for things like epilepsy and they are being housed with those who have committed actual crimes, it is very terrifying. From all the sources we have found, the hospital really grew between 1848 and 1948. It was during this period that two buildings were constructed for patients to live. They have been described as massive and castle-like, and these buildings were called the Seven Gables. It's amazing to me that the hospital really grew to be self-sustaining. 
they were able to create their own little world. This is what we found on the hauntedhouses.com website. The hospital had a, quote, sick hospital, which treated physical ailments, a farm colony which provided occupational therapy, a chapel, a recreation facility, a fire station, a cannery where patients worked, pathology department, and a laundry facility, end quote. The hospital also later had its own power station. And something I think very creepy is the worst patients. For example, those who had screamed nonstop or were known to attack the staff or even other patients, they were kept down in the basement of the pathology building in the beginning of the hospital's, you know, the opening of years. I do think that it's creepy. So there was a method for building mental institutions during the 19th century called the Kirkbride Plan. The Kirkbride Plan is a type of mental institution designed by American psychiatrist Thomas Story Kirkbride. Kirkbride had a philosophy that he called moral treatment, which was based on compassion and respect for the mentally ill. Buildings were built in a way that they felt would create a humane environment that would help the patients to heal. So Kirkbride Method buildings are built with staggered corridors that come off from the center. If you Google them and you guys take a look at it, it looks like wings from either a bat or a bird. And standard practice for a Kirkbride plan was that it would have eight corridors and it could accommodate 250 patients. There were at least 73 hospitals in the U.S. built using this plan. According to the Wikipedia page about the Kirkbride plan, 33 of these buildings still exist today. Central State Hospital buildings were torn down in the 1970s. A large lawn now stands where the Seven Gables building once stood. Interesting. Another creepy discovery is that under the hospital, there were five miles of tunnel. The tunnels used to connect to other buildings on the grounds. There is a neat Indie Star article that we found that shows pictures of the entrances to the tunnels connecting to the old power station. The pictures show signs where the entrances were and what it's connected to. This tunnel system also had rooms off the tunnels that had shackles on the walls. According to the Indie Star article, the tunnels collapsed once the buildings were torn down. And that's very disturbing. I know back then restraint was the most common way that patients were kept under control. That's correct. The medicine and treatments we have today did not exist back then. It's very sad. And I agree with you. It's very sad. According to the hauntedhouses.com website, quote, as of 2003, the city of Indianapolis has bought the 146 acre property with plans for a cultural center, a park, and to develop some of the land to bring in taxes, end quote. Don't worry, listeners. The city has stated that they will be sure to move any of the graves if they have to. Oh, my. This seems like something we have heard before. Anyone remember the Poltergeist movie? Yes. Mary, that was my first thought when I read that. We will be back after a short break to talk about the recently discovered graves and the history of hauntings on the grounds. So we're back to discuss the unmarked graves and some of the ghost lore. It's not surprising to me that patients were buried in unmarked graves on the grounds. According to the hauntedhouses.com site, patients were buried at the, quote, northwest corner of the hospital's property where Vermont Street connects with Tibbs Avenue. Also, patients' remains were buried along the western edge along Tibbs Avenue and near the old pathology building as well, end quote. According to an Indie Star article, as of 2020, Ball State University archaeology students are working on trying to figure out where these graves are. Yeah, they have teamed up with the Indiana Medical History Museum. Okay, so let's get into some of the locations on the ground that are reported to be haunted. We are using reports listed on the hauntedhouses.com website. So we will start with the old powerhouse. And the basement here is what is most reported to have had incidences. And what is most reported are screams of a woman. When the building was in operation, maintenance workers had to go down there to shovel ashes out of the furnace, and they would have to do this twice a day. They did not like to go down there because of the screams. Shadows are often seen roaming around the basement. The old conveyor belt to the furnace has turned on in the past. 
And one of the creepiest incidences for this particular building concerns an employee who thought he'd go down to the basement of the old powerhouse for a nap. Yes, this employee decided that it would be a great idea to take a nap in one of the basement rooms that was right by the pumping station. And this guy wakes up because he can feel hands on his throat and he's being choked. This guy quickly breaks free somehow and is able to turn on a light switch only to find no one there. What I find even creepier is that there were actually red marks on the man's skin around his neck. Yep, that would do it for me. It would have been my last day at work for sure. There is also a legend about the tunnels themselves, and it concerns a patient named Al who went missing. He was not in a secure area of the hospital. Police and staff looked for him but couldn't find him anywhere. Eventually, they end their search convinced that he had escaped. So sometime later, a nurse sees one of the female patients at the entrance to one of the tunnels. And she tells the nurse she's just talking to a man named Al. Listeners, they do a search of the tunnels and find Al's body down there. And I have never heard whether Al was murdered or if he had just passed away from natural causes. But story says they had discovered his body. That's disturbing. Footsteps are also heard in the old administration building. The old pathology building, which is now the Indiana Medical History Museum, is interesting. Noises are reported from the basement here. See, that is very disturbing, knowing that this is where autopsies were done. Yeah, and the grounds themselves seem to be haunted. There are reports about people seeing robed figures running around the grounds like they are trying to escape. And there was at least one documented murder of a patient by other patients. And this murder took place outside on the grounds underneath an area with lots of trees. Many people have heard the screams of the victim to this day. Very unsettling. Now, of course, officially, it's reported by the city and the park officials that it's not a haunted location. However, there's a 176-year history here and too many stories that say otherwise. Have you ever had an experience at the Central State Hospital? Are you familiar with the background and history of the hospital? We would love to hear about it. Please send us an email to whosyourmissinglegends at gmail.com or reach out to us on social media. We may use it in a later episode. In the email, let us know if you wish to remain anonymous. see our source material, please visit our website, whosyourmissinglegends.com. Please find us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and now Twitter. Who's Your Missing Legends is a Quigley Productions podcast. Our theme song was written and recorded by Wet Blanket. The song title is Taxidermy Race Car. As always, stay spooky.